Good morning and welcome to the seventh meeting in 2015 um, of the Health and Sport Committee. I uh, would ask everyone at this point, as I normally do, to switch off my mobile phones as they can often interfere with the sound system. Um, I ask you also to note that uh, um, some of us are using tablet devices um, uh, instead of a hard copy of our papers. Uh, I have apologies this morning from uh, Dennis Robertson, who's not able to be with us, uh, and uh, welcome Graeme Day as the SMP substitute to the committee this morning. Welcome, Graeme. Our uh, first item on the agenda today is a decision on taking business, uh, business in private. Um, I invite, invite the committee to agree to take item four uh, in private. Item four is our approach paper uh, to our work on infertility, and we normally take our pro approach papers in private. Uh, can I have the committee's agreement to do that? Great, great, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> um, item two, of course, um, is a number of uh, uh, negative instruments that we have before us today. And the first instrument um, before us uh, is the Health and Care Professionals Council Registration and Fees Amendment Rules Order Council 2015 SI 2015-93. Um, there has been no motion to annul uh, and the Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee has not made any recommendations as to the instrument. Uh, do any uh, committee members have any comment on the instrument? No. Um, we have uh, no comment uh, from any committee members at this point. Um, can I therefore ask if the committee has agreed to make no recommendation? Agreed. Thank you. Our second instrument is Fish Labelling Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015 SSI 2015 448. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Power, Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, I invite comment from the committee. Mike McKenzie. As convener, I'd like to welcome this instrument and just draw the committee's attention to the fact that what this instrument does is um, differentiate between fish that are sustainably caught and those that are perhaps um, caught by uh, unsustainable methods and also country of origin and um, convener in particular I would like to recommend given that this is the health and sport committee recommend Scottish fish as a truly healthy food Thank you Mike um, Thank you for that contribution Is there any other comments from any committee members? Thank you Has um, is, uh, uh, is the committee agreed then to make no recommendations? Thank you, that is agreed. Uh, the third instrument is National Assistance, uh, assistance uh, Assessment of Resources Amendment Scotland Regulation 2015. Again, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers uh, and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Do we have any comment from committee members? No. We have no comment from committee members. Uh, can I uh, seek agreement for the committee that we make no recommendations? Great. Thank you. The fourth instrument uh, is National Assistance Sums uh, for Personal Requirements, Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI, 2015-65. There has again been no motion to uh, annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, uh, do we have any comments from committee members? We, we, we have no comments from committee members. Do the committee agree, therefore, that uh, no recommendations are made? That is agreed. Thank you. We now move to agenda item number three, which uh, is our first look at uh, the legacy from the Commonwealth Games held, of course, in Glasgow last summer. We have a round table this week and another next week, and uh, it is an issue that the committee is committed to returning to. Clearly, this item is al also relates back to our 2012 inquiry and support uh, 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 for community sport. As usual with the round table, um, um, you know, I, 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 I'll introduce myself and then go round the table. My name is Duncan McNeil. I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament for Greenland and Inverclyde and convener of the Health and Sport Committee here in the Scottish Parliament. 
Bob. Thanks, Convener. Uh, my name is Bob Doris, Member of the Scottish <coughs> Parliament for Glasgow, and I'm Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Hi, good morning. Stuart Harris, Chief Executive of Sports Scotland. Mike McKenzie, MSP, uh, and I represent the Highlands and Islands region. Morning, my name is Billy Garrett. I'm the Head of Sport at Glasgow Life. Nanette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Good morning, Ian Murray from High Life Highland. Good morning, I'm Graham Day, the MSP for Angus South. Rhoda Grant, MSP for the Highlands and Islands. Uh, good morning, Dean Wilkinson, Sport and Physical Activity Development Manager at Edinburgh Leisure. Yes, yes. Kim Atkinson, I'm the Chief Executive of the Scottish Sports Association. Richard Lyle, MSP, Central Region. Good morning, Eamon John, East Lothian Council, with responsibility for sport, countryside and leisure. Richard Simpson, MSP, Red Scotland, and Fife. Thank you all for that. Um, begin with a, a, a softball, you know, to, for, for the witnesses here this morning, and to those who participate in our panel, and uh, ask them a, a general question that... Uh, uh, how they see the bodies that they represent uh, contribute to uh, the active legacy of the Commonwealth Games. Stuart. Thank you, Kivina. Um When the Games were announced for Glasgow in 2007, um, I think the sector saw an opportunity. Sport Scotland in, in particular um, sought to put in place and perform a, a leadership role and try and bring the, se the, the sector together looking at building a world-class system for sport at every level, for everyone in Scotland, uh, schools, clubs, performance, people in places driving that, but underpinned, even around this table, by lots of very strong partnerships. Our two specific uh, legacy commitments, and there are others that we've, we've influenced, were around the performances at the Games through a sustainable performance system, uh, 53 medals, 63 medalists, talks for itself and the other one was around community was uh, the commitment to pro provide and work in, with partners to, to construct 150 community sport hubs so far we've got 137 that are active and evolving um, 167 are on the stocks and about 58 percent 60 percent are in schools and we think there's some real potential to build this on through 2020 Lots of other contributions through facilities, but a lot of other colleagues give a bit more of a local picture. Right, thanks, Stuart. Anyone else? I'm quite happy to. But Sorry. The, and then the, the Eamon. Thanks. Um, obviously, uh, I'm from Glasgow Life, and obviously the Commonwealth Games um, has loomed large in our work plans for a number of years. Um, Glasgow... Um, developed a legacy plan which covered five years before and five years after the Games. So, in a sense, we're still in the midst of that program. Um, there were six key themes for that legacy plan. Uh, prosperity, more active, international image, um, more greener, more accessible and more inclusive. Um, and at the moment, all of these themes are in the green in terms of delivering on the um, actions that were set out uh, all those years ago. Um, obviously, there was a mention there of facilities, part uh, of the legacy, um, and one in which we continue to work is the physical legacy of the Games, obviously. Glasgow is very proud that all of our venues utilised by the Commonwealth Games were opened one year at least before the Games, and the first people to use them were the community in Glasgow. Uh, and the community in Glasgow continue to use these uh, facilities um, very heavily. Um, also, we um, have seen some positive um, measures around participation, um, and we continue to work uh, with clubs in the city around both our community sport hub agenda, uh, which we obviously deliver in partnership with Sport Scotland, um, but also around coach uh, education, uh, volunteering, um, and capacity building amongst clubs. Um, some of the statistics which are included in the submission uh, are passed on are very encouraging, but obviously we're not complacent. Um, every statistic tells something, but obviously there's a, there's, a, there's a wider picture in terms of household surveys and overall health surveys. And from Glasgow's perspective, we are certainly clear there's a lot of work still to be done, uh, but we think the direction of travel is currently very positive. Thanks. Eamon? 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, you heard from the, the national agency and, and the host city, but I think one of the important things around the Games was around Anola Scotland Games and 32 local authorities being part of that national celebration opportunities that the Games uh, provided. I think the springboard for us all was the Games legacy. It was a framework. We were able to contextualise that and then look at that at a local level in respect of delivery. So for us, our focus areas around being part of that all of Scotland approach to the Games was around key areas in relation to PE and school sport, club development, coach teacher education, district squads, and our performance athletes within the county as well. So we were servicing that performance opportunity and exit routes within our schools and communities. But a big part of our focus as all well was to see a real physical infrastructure legacy. So we were able to absolutely work uh, as the Chief Executive of Sports Scotland has alluded to in relation to partnership with the National Agency to look at facility infrastructure on the ground that our communities could benefit from longer term, leaving a legacy. And, and, as, a, and as a small local authority, a relatively small local authority, we were able to invest with our partners eight million linked to Games Legacy in relation to active infrastructure. So that was a big part for us. I'm not going to drop into detail of numbers and data just now, and that may, may come out through questions, but the early observations are and the indications are that school sport programmes for our active schools, our community sports hubs, those indications in relation to numbers, engagement, activities are going in the right direction. Ian Murray. Um, with the rural and scattered nature of Highland, um, our focus was less on development of large facilities, but more on uh, helping communities to do more for themselves. It was always going to be about communities um, helping more, helping to do more themselves. So, uh, volunteering um, absolutely is at the heart of our leg legacy plan. Um, at the moment, there are building blocks in place, which is um, older primary school kids helping to run sessions for the wee tots at the, at the bottom of primary school, secondary school kids running for primary school kids, and becoming trained in sports leader awards, etc. And what we were keen to do was to take those building blocks and turn it into a leadership programme so that there was support for a whole fresh generation of volunteers coming through. And now what we're seeing is those people coming through the system and at the top end are now being introduced to other achievement awards, volunteering awards, um, and, and moving them, hand-holding them into club situations so that there's a whole fresh generation of volunteers going into clubs to help re replace some of the older generation who are coming out of it. And to us, that's what the real enthusiasm of the Games has given. It's given agencies a real enthusiasm to support volunteers better, but it's also given a whole new generation of people an interest in sport and volunteering that hopefully can then f feed through to the club system. Thanks, Ian. Kim? Thanks, Convener. Um, just building on some of the points that, that colleagues have made, I think the, the biggest success to a degree of, of the Games themselves and the legacy of the Games to date has been that partnership working. It's been that, that focus across sport, across the country, about, about making a difference and leaving that lasting legacy. And I think in no small part, as I say, has been that partnership working. But it's also been the, that, that focus of resource and the political will which has come behind that. So, so obviously, I guess thinking about the legacy in the seven years since we won the bid, then obviously there's been huge progress and, and you know it's been, been really positive to read the submissions that everybody's made of those great case studies and those great examples which show the legacy that, that's been built up to date. From the point of view of our members as the governing bodies for the different sports in Scotland, they, they've got similar positive case studies in terms of growths in membership, volunteering as Ian was talking about, officiating, you know, different events, different people getting involved, coaching, etc. Um, and I think Part of today coming together in, in, in my mind is around where all those successes have come together. So looking at some of the legacy strands of the programme, some of the asks that our members have made in the longer term around what they would like to see around legacy. A lot of the success in that comes out in the case studies that have been presented by partners today and showing actually if we all work together, th then obviously we can get that, that bit further. And I think there is further opportunity within that without, without question. As I say, it's been seven years since we won the bid. There's been an awful lot of progress. And I suppose in, in the minds of my members, it would be about looking forward and saying, great, so where can we be seven years, 14 years, 21 years? If we continue with that resource, we continue with that, that political will and we continue with that partnership working. Okay. Bob? Um, yeah, thanks, um, convener. Um, it's it's um, clearly a, a very good story um, to tell here. Now, the line of questioning is not going to be just opportunities for people to tell that good story, but it's almost like next steps and look over some of the numbers. So as a Glasgow MSP, you'd expect me to be able to ask pick through some of the Glasgow Life numbers, and a lot of very impressive numbers there, but I refer to 
to, to your submission. I'm keen that more people get active, and by that I, I don't mean, I mean like people becoming active for the first time, um, and not just people who are already very active becoming more active. And I, I was looking at the the type of people that use Glasgow Club membership, for example, and it was categorised into five areas. With I suppose the one jumping out would be the hard press category that that, that you use, where um, across Glasgow, um, the profile of Glasgow, I think, if I'm reading this right, would have 49.2% of those you would categorise as hard pressed, and the profile of those that use Glasgow Life facilities is 41.8%. Um, so obviously a bit of work to do, but hopefully that's a closing gap. So I'd be interested to know, obviously from other providers as well, how you're getting on with that kind of thing, that whether there's been a closing of that gap. So because 41.8 to 49.2 isn't brilliant, but it might show progress. So it's an opportunity for you to see whether there's been progress in relation to people who are most deprived communities accessing Glasgow uh, life facilities. Uh, and the second thing is, do you monitor? Because obviously you could have 41.8% of people from the most deprived areas having one visit to a Glasgow life facility over the year or two or three, but someone from uh, the wealthy achievers or the comfortably off, these are the categories within the submission that Glasgow Life use, having 10, 15, 20, 30 visits a year. So it's just to try and get a kind of nuance around around those numbers, particularly for Glasgow Life, but how some of the other providers would, would monitor that to make sure. I mean, it's good if people who are kind of fit and healthy get even more fit and healthy, but what we're really interested in is people who have been less active or not active at all getting involved um, and I do have a follow up question for Glasgow Life later if that's okay convener yeah, but yeah, just in terms yeah, of that but I think we are interested yeah. in this and, and maybe some focus on hard press it's a new sort of definition to this committee is usually mm -hmm. dealing with poverty absolute poverty deprivation mm -hmm. this is a new one yeah. that on us so maybe a wee bit of explanation than that well these categories are from the khaki uh, statistics so they're not categories that Glasgow Life have, have determined yeah, um, yeah. and actually I think I think the the, the questions that you've asked are really good ones and they're actually questions that we discuss extensively within Glasgow Sport. Um, on the one hand, I think when I, when I made my initial comments, I did make reference to the fact that certainly from a Glasgow perspective, it's important that we are not complacent about some of the positive statistics in this submission. And that, that issue around representation and ensuring that our service users, the people that we work with the people that we engage with represent the, the community of Glasgow is a really, really key one uh, and one that we do try to focus on. Um, in, in some ways, that latest set of statistics in terms of the demographics of Glasgow Club members took us slightly by surprise. We thought that the gap, if you like, between our uh, membership and the overall population would be slightly bigger. So in a sense, we were encouraged. Uh, that gap has closed, um, along with overall membership of the Glasgow Club expanding, um, that gap has closed. Again, when we talk about the Glasgow Club, we're clear what that means and what it doesn't mean. Obviously, we have roughly 65,000 Glasgow Club members in a city of 600,000. That's a really, really positive figure. And it does tell us something about people being involved in physical activity. Um, but it could be a small number of people you know, who, who are, you know, are very, you know, very active. But there is an element of the population city who are still not active. And from our point of view, just so that we're absolutely clear, our absolute focus is on getting the disengaged engaged, getting the, the, the inactive active. And to that extent, we have launched recently, you might know, um, a number of initiatives. One, the most significant being uh, what we call the Good Move programme, which we manage in partnership with the National Health Service and uh, a number of housing associations in the city. And those are what we describe as adoption programmes. So these are programmes absolutely designed and tailored and targeted to, to reach people who are inactive. So we look across every conceivable barrier to activity. Now, those barriers can include affordability, they can include location, they can include the nature of the programme. So we're trying to break out of the leisure facility um, model, take... Uh, products into a community context and community facilities, school halls, church halls, wherever. Uh, in terms of how we market and advertise, we're trying to be innovative. So we've had staff going out visiting bingo halls, we've been marketing in local supermarkets, and a whole range of initiatives, some of which will work, some of which might not. 
but are absolutely designed to touch people that we're currently not touching. So that is that is a real priority for us, and I think I think I think it's important to, to be clear about that that there is still work to be done there. Okay. Is there any other comments on the, in terms of participation argument who we're reaching, Stuart? Um, just to kind of pick up uh, that theme about projecting forward, you know, we talked about a system, more of a system for sport, and you know, we've got active schools being in place for ten years now, community sport hubs for four years. What we're looking at now is how we plug additional resources into that infrastructure, which I think is quite exciting to do. So we can look at areas where there's the greatest need and begin to look at how we further support community sport hubs in developing people. There's a theme underlying all of this, which I think is very positive around giving the power back to communities in a, in a sense, which allows, that is the essence of a community sport hub, it's, it's for local people to decide what they're doing, to manage their own programs uh, with support, uh, not in isolation, um, from, from professionals across the piece. It's a bit of a change in landscape, a mixed economy I've referred to before, where you have, yes, uh, provision through trusts and, and other local, local bodies, but also communities being able to be in control of what they do. And bringing that community together, I think we've seen some real positive direction going forward. Now, our commitment going forward to active schools another four years, fifty million pounds. Community sport hubs I think could be could be never ending, which is an, an area which I think has got huge potential uh, going forward to bring communities together and put a community hub in each community in Scotland. We're well designed for that with small towns and communities. Bigger cities are more of a challenge. But I think if we use the infrastructure to target more uh, in a partnership sense, then I think that could be fruitful. Anyone else? I'm just trying to elicit some more responses for the team because I'm 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 looking for outcomes here actually because you know we've you know the, uh, we we're touching on uh, the outcomes and the, the, there has been uh, some data there that's been presented and you know and others and I think we're still awaiting some of the initial reports so we're. You know, uh, we're looking for some of that. But Ian, you, you, you wanted to come in and say something about Highland? Or? Thank you. Um, our, our area operates a, a very cheap, all-inclusive membership scheme, which is aimed specifically at that band of people, yes, below the benefits line, but that band of families which are just above the benefit line. Now, we don't really regard sort of well-off middle classes as our target market. The target market is that the people who need a healthy lifestyle the most, if you, say, if you like. And very like Glasgow Life, we're now trying very much to get away from just waiting for people to come in. We're going out to other facilities and other community um, facilities to see people. But one of, the, one of the big strides forward I think we're making is the relationship with the NHS, where NHS have got their own heat targets to meet, and sometimes they're having difficulty in meeting and getting people active um, relating to avoidance of cancer, etc. And so instead of... Um, waiting for people to come in the door. What we're finding now is where we're getting real success is people being handheld into the door um, by the NHS with us together. Um, and that, that gets people across the door that otherwise would never really want to take part in activity within a local authority type um, facility setting. Bob, you wanted to go back and just clarify some of that. And I think, Graeme, did you want a supplementary mm. on, Bob? Um, okay. Um, uh, thank you. I think obviously just in some of the, the stats that, that uh, M M Mr Garrett was given, you said that the the gap had closed. Um, are you able to quantify that? Because obviously the baseline was 41 point. I don't think it hung up in the numbers. It's just more about making sure it is measured and, and, and the statistics are there rather than debating the figures. That's not the reason for asking it. But So it was 41.8%. Um, what was it before or what is it now? Well, the, one of the issues is that it, it, it's previously it was measured in a very different way um, because obviously this analysis is, is, is if you like, the, carried out in, in terms of the most recent language and the most recent kind of categories. Previously it was recorded differently. Um, I can't remember the, the statistics, but I can certainly get them to you. That, um, would, be, that would be good. Yeah. I apologize. I'm not trying no, to cut no, you off. Right. There's a number of little kind of... Th Kind of stepping stones to what I'm trying to draw out in, in, in my head that I want to ask. And so, are you able to provide information on how many of the 
the 41.8% that are using the facilities are using it less than five times a year or less than 10 times a year or less than 15 times a year? Do you have that information? We do, yes. Each, every member, uh, every time they utilise one of our facilities, that's mm. recorded so we can break that down. Um, and, and I mean, there's a whole... The committee might be interested, and certainly you, you may well be interested. We've actually got a significant amount of data in terms of the Glasgow Club, um, in terms of not just how frequently, but uh, you know which facilities. There's some interesting t statistics mm -hmm. that um, of our facilities. Something like 85% of mm -hmm. users come from within a mile or a mile and a half of the facility. So it's very much a a local usage pattern of each of our facilities, which is sometimes surprising. I think that would be quite good, and I, I'm not asking the questions of yeah, the other yeah, providers, but... But, but, we're, but we're, we're asking the panel. No, so no, but I'm, but I'm just... I know, but, but, I'm really, but, but the point I'm making is getting round about how we can compare across the country to see that the figures are collected in a structured way across the country in yeah. relation to that, and obviously that would have been helpful in, in... You didn't know what we were asking for, but that would have been helpful in submissions. I suppose the final thing, and then I'll let, let everyone else in, convener, is, and, and, and it would be nice of me not to do this, you mentioned affordability, um, and a, a constituent um, said to me the other day, they stay in the Somerston area of Glasgow, they run a local boys football team in Somerston, there's a Glasgow Life facility at John Paul Academy, sits empty for much of the time, they can't afford to use it. I've sought to use it. I've only just been given this case, Mr Garrett. I don't expect you particularly to respond to it, but could I maybe get a commitment from you that I could talk to you directly about how we could do something there to make sure that my constituents can use a facility that's sitting empty? In terms of that specific issue, absolutely. And, and what I can say in general, and I, I mentioned it deliberately, is we do recognise, we do recognise that affordability is one of a number of barriers. You know, it is, and we have... You might know we, we offer a, a significant number of services completely free of charge. Um, but we do charge for a number of services. We try and make those as affordable as possible. But usually, um, usually, um, and I think some of our usage statistics support this, usually um, the community can, you know, in partnership with us, can find ways to utilise the facilities. Somerston, an area I know well, actually, and there's a real tradition of community football in that part of Glasgow. Uh, and a number of very, uh, very well organised local clubs, Maryhill Harp, Somerston Juniors, I can think of, I can think of others. So I'd, I'd be quite happy to have that chat with you. Yeah. yeah. I just, and if I didn't raise it, I'd have my constituent have said oh, you had the opportunity. Yep. Yep. Why yep. did you yep. not? Yep. We, 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 yep. we'll excuse you for that. <laughs> for that, 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 Somerston or whatever it was. But uh, we, the, the important, the important issue. That, uh, I, I, I think we'll eventually get back to the, the, the focus that the committee had in its report, which was more strategic, it was about support, it was about volunteers and whatever, whatever. Of course, though, the numbers that we're looking at here and how they're collated, what drives them to ensure that there's not gaming going on and everything else and it's not linked to money and whatever, whatever, as we see in others when you present the numbers. You know, I think we're, we're, we are interested in that. G Graeme, you wanted to ask a, a sort of follow-up with Bob's, and then we need to give the, the, the panel an opportunity to respond if they wish to do uh, thank so. You, thank you, convener. And actually, <coughs> taking your guidance on this and trying to broaden it out to wider Scotland, um, in seeking to get the disengaged engaged, are the charging regimes in place across a range of facilities across the whole of Scotland pitched at people from deprived backgrounds uh, and if we, they are, can we have some examples? Now, if you look at Edinburgh as a case, it offers a 10 for 8 um, uh, on swimming at the Commonwealth Pool. Very good. But it's still £48. Is that um, too, too high a charge, for example, for many pockets in Edinburgh? And if I can maybe broaden it out further, can I be clear on to what degree Joe Public can walk up to these sports hubs on spec uh, seeking to utilise the facilities, or do they generally have to be members of the participatory clubs? I'll give you a break, but, I'll, I'll, but I will come back to you because you'll have you, you'll, you'll have in, in Glasgow strategy. Is there anyone else that we, you, we, Dean? Yeah, I mean, just in terms of the, the question regarding the temporary pricing, um, it's one of a number of pricing points that we have. That's a specific reference to a, a membership. I mean, the membership is is very popular overall our members across the the border 22,000 members in terms of the temporary there's 1500 members who are taking that opportunity up um, 
generally around sort of access points in terms of um, sort of making our facilities, our services more accessible. We've got a number of pricing points raising from uh, going from sort of free access for a number of weeks to get people into the system to one pound a week, moving up to half price, full price. So there's a, a total range and it almost goes back to the original question in terms of what are we doing to act on that sort of legacy that we're trying to do. I think from Edinburgh Leisure's point of view, our purpose is about making a positive difference, creating opportunities to take part. We predominantly obviously manage a, a portfolio of facilities, around about 30 facilities, but we also have a sport and physical activity development team, which is very proactive, picking up on some of, our, uh, some of my colleagues' comments earlier in terms of getting out into the community, working with Hard to Reach, working with partners across Edinburgh. I think that's also another important point in terms of knowing what our position and our place is. We've got a great opportunity in delivering the new sport and physical activity strategy across Edinburgh. And, and through that, we're able to sustain some of those programmes that were put in place because of that drive and enthusiasm and commitment behind the Games at the time. One of our challenges is around keeping some of those schemes sustainable. Great exam example being the High Flyers Wheelchair Sports Club. One of the first wheelchair sports clubs in the region. It was something they kicked off on the back of that enthusiasm and we're keeping that going and that's still in place. So quite a, you know, a small legacy in inverted commas on a really uh, sort of core face and delivery perspective. Um, but yeah, I think, come back to your point, very important to understand what the barriers are. How do we remove those barriers? How do we increase access across a range of communities? Can we, can we, can we broaden it out to, to get back into the strategic thing? I mean, and, and, and one of the recommendations of the committee way back in 2013 was that those sports strategies that were beginning to become underway alongside the sport hubs. Now, do, are the sports strategies in place, I mean, you know, right across the, the, all of the local authorities, do they reflect the issue of access, equality, participation? Because the access issue, as we found at that point in time, wasn't necessarily the price. It was the fact that, you know, up to 60% or, or something could be closed during the holidays. Now, given the investment, of, the public investment that put into some of the new schools and the facilities that surround them, you know, to have them lying there, wee boys at the gate, looking through, is simply, you know, it's not, it's not a question of money. Uh, you know, but you, you know, are the strategies in place? Are they making a difference? Are they addressing the issues of access in terms of cost and and just being open at weekends, public holidays, and whatever? Maybe uh, we could broaden it out uh, to to that. Then maybe Eamon. and then Billy, I think. Honing in on and, and Bob's point as well, you know. Yeah. Two things I'd like to cover. One is the issue around, you know, you highlighted Glasgow, but what the challenges for Glasgow absolutely will be significant on a greater scale, but the principles will be consistent across the 32 local authorities. That bit about moving from inactive to active is an absolute focus across local government just now, and we'll all be in challenge with that, linked to our SOAs, etc. So we will be designing interventions to try and meet that significant challenge, because we know what the wider benefits are longer term to the individuals, to communities, and, and indeed the public pound. So those interventions will be taking place. If I can give you some specifics on that, rather than that, that overall statement, we would be looking right now, as we are, through our self-evaluation, through looking at hickeyogs and tools that we use, how good is our culture and sport, what are we doing to take a closer look at inequalities? So in the, in the authority I'm on, people die earlier than they do in one end of the county to the other, what programs and interventions are we designing that we hope are going to have a positive impact? We're then trying to measure the uptake. So the uptake of people accessing Glasgow Life or the uptake of people accessing our facilities. We've engaged in a citizens panel recently where we're trying to capture that data. But we're also looking at interventions that allow people in a certain category, i.e. benefits, i.e. children and families on benefits, and how we allow them access to facilities, A, at times free of charge, and B, at peak times, at concessionary rates. And when we're then designing new sporting facilities, i.e. 3G pitches, how we look to design payment structures that cater for clubs that are trying to be connected from children's and youth to adults within communities, where they can have 
concessionary rates a club rate rather than a group of us around this table who can afford to pay just having an evening let. So we're trying to design accordingly to meet some of the challenges that you're raising there. The, you know, the, the question is, is, does your sports strategy yeah. lay all of that out clearly? Business plan. So forget the titles of whether it's a strategy or whatever. Have we got the documents in place across local government that captures that? Yes. And it's got your ambitions, it's got your targets, where you're looking for. And it's that would be in a service that. business plan, so a strategy. Is that, is, that, is that common in every local authority throughout Scotland now? Billy, and I'll, I'll give you an opportunity, yeah. Stuart. Yeah. We have, um, at, a, at a Glasgow life level, there is a business and service plan, which is what we call that particular document. And then underneath that, there's an individual business and service plan, for instance, for Glasgow sport. Um, I, think, I think the point you made about an overall strategy is a key one. So within Glasgow Sport, we approach the issue of access, and I use that term in its widest sense, in a strategic way. We certainly don't believe that that moving people from inactivity to activity is all about how many people come in through to our facilities. We are, that's one part of a really big story. Um, so we work, I mentioned Good Move, but also we, there's a major review, for instance, live in Glasgow just now, about utilisation of the school estate. Um, utilisation levels in overall terms within Glasgow, the school, the school estate are low, uh, and we're looking at ways to, to maximise utilisation of that school estate, and we do that in partnership with education, active schools and others. So that's a real priority for us at the moment. The work that we uh, do with clubs in the city is also part of that access strategy, because that is another route for people to get involved in physical activity and sport in a local context. So we try to look at it in a, in a holistic sense, it's a, you know, in, in terms of access. Clearly, what's important for the members of this committee is that issue about affordability, and, and I can assure you it's, it's a key issue for the elected members in Glasgow as well. Um, it's a really difficult one. It's one that we have to navigate our way through, you know, and, and managing that in a context of a reasonably challenging financial landscape is, is a challenge that we all face across the country. Um, the Glasgow Club, the membership scheme, just to, to go back to the point that I think you were making, that's only one way that you can get access to our facilities. You can just sit, sit, literally just walk up to any Glasgow sport facility um, and if, if it's a free offer, utilise that, or if it's something you have to pay for, you can pay for that. There's no requirement to be a member of the Glasgow Club. That That is an offer that we make, which is quite attractive, but it's certainly not the only way you can get in. We operate free swimming, we operate free five-a-side football, we operate free tennis, free bowls. Um, you know, there's a number of things that we offer free within the city. Um, obviously, uh, it, it would make, you know, if the finances allowed, it might be possible to, to, do, to do more. Although I would say one thing, we've operated some of those schemes in Glasgow for a number of years, free swimming, to take that one. And what's interesting is that uh, if over time, it, you couldn't really see that that making it free has actually resulted in a, in a significant increase in participation in that particular program. So again, I think it's important that we look across all of the barriers. Some of those are physical. We're also focusing, uh, along with our colleagues in social work, on you know access for disabled communities and disabled participants, because that's another barrier. The location of facilities is another barrier just threshold anxiety, people thinking these facilities are not for them. That's another barrier. And we do try in a strategic sense to work across all of those. Okay. It's been brought to me, actually, that f free football and the free parts that's been given doesn't make it free for the kids who participate because the clubs still charge the same fee as they were charging when they were paying for, for pitches and things. You know? So it's not necessarily passed on, but, but that, you know, they, I'm sure they're using the money wisely. Kim? <coughs> Thank you, convener. Um, the school estate, as, as you've well heard us, uh, us talk about before, is, it remains an issue, and, but also an opportunity, if that makes sense. So we've heard some good figures about, about the availability. As, as you would expect, we still think that there is more that can be done. Um, I think we're, we're several steps forward from where we've been in the last few years with the report that Sports Scotland provided, I think was a lesson for everybody in what is open, what isn't available, where there are opportunities to work more collaboratively together. And, and there is a focus around the programming of facilities, around the management of those facilities, but also how um, facilities can be best optimised 
organised where the facilities do work in partnership with the local clubs and the local area. And again, there are any number of great case studies on that. So I think it's it's a positive story of progress. But as you would expect, I suspect from our members, you know, I think there are further opportunities. And again, that, that partnership working is, is at the key of that. Um, the affordability point that, that Graham picked up on, again, is something that, that some of our members would raise, particularly around some of the team sports, uh, around access to facilities where that does remain a challenge. Um, as you picked up yourself, convener, yes, sometimes there, you know, that can have a positive impact on um, the membership to a club. Um, now, sometimes that might be that the club can then do more with the money if there is more affordable access to facilities, that they might be investing in the infrastructure that is the people that make that club club operate. So, you know, there are any number of ways a club may invest to provide the best quality of experience or best number of experiences around taster sessions and other bits and pieces. So I think it's a, a slightly more complex landscape from, from that point of view. Ultimately, I think the challenges continue to come for our local authority partners and they'll speak uh, better on that than, than certainly I would convener around a challenge of budgets. And, and you've heard me, me say it before, but I think that cross-budgeting remains a challenge for, for sport. Uh, and certainly, you know, we, we hear a lot of, of discussion around that. And, I, you know, I'd be intrigued to hear from partners. You know, Ian's got some really great case studies that, that I'm sure the committee would be, be keen to hear about and other partners as well, about where, where that prevention agenda really sits between particularly health, mental health and, and sport and that relationship. And I think, you know, if, if we are strategic about looking at cross-budgeting, I think that looks slightly different differently for sport. You know, the point that Billy was making in saying that the number of percentage of their members that, that use local facilities, again, are huge opportunities. But if there are pressures on budgets which jeopardise those facilities, then what does that look, look like around participation? So I think we need to be a little bit more strategic about some of that budgeting. And I suppose there potentially is an opportunity for the committee to further contribute to that. I'm, I'm sure there's no accident that you're the health and sport committee. And again, maybe there is an opportunity that the committee can support some of that work and really gathering that evidence around the benefits of people participating in sport and being active. What, what are those benefits? What do they look like? Where can we hear some of the great case studies that colleagues will have to tell today? And how can we use that as evidence? And what, what's, what can the committee do to add value to, to that research and to champion the research that I'm, I'm confident would, would come out of that? So an opportunity there, hopefully, convener. Well, uh, Stuart, access to the, these public schools and things, that's still, a, it's still, yeah. still an issue that's being tackled. You know, it's about, we can take evidence, but three years ago, well, two and a half years ago or something, we, we raised that as a big, a big issue about access to our schools and public and we're hearing today it's still an issue, but progress has been made. But Stuart's going to tell me how much progress <laughs> is, be, is going to be has been um, made. We've we've just completed uh, a conversation, strategic conversation with all thirty two local authorities and their partners. Um, three kind of focal points of those conversations. One about ambition. You know how ambitious are they? Um, Secondly, in terms of the, the key outcomes of participation and progression, so people moving on, but people just getting, getting engaged in sport, trying to ascertain what's possible in those areas. The two key elements that will either provide the tra traction towards success or maybe just stability is the resource allocation. So what resources are available that we can add some value to as a national agency? And again, that's all we can really do is add value to what's going on locally. And I guess the integration, when we talked a few years ago, uh, Duncan, there was lots of strategies out there, but many of them were disparate. Um, what we are now insisting on in Sports Scotland is that we have a combined sport and th the facilities pieces inside all of that. Now, every local authority has a strategic context, which is connected to their own level of ambition and resourcing. But they are very different. If it was uniform, um, then it'd be fantastic. We'd all probably be out of a job, but there's still work to do in certain areas depending on the level of resource and the ambition that they're, they're aiming for. We've got quite a lot of data. Um, I guess, for me, others can, can, can talk about this themselves. There's probably more data in place than there was a few years back about the school estate's a, a good example. I mean, there is that, that data is accurate. It's up to date. It's in the public domain about how much space is available and how much demand there could could be to, to use it. Um, but it does have a resource ask and a programming ask. But people are, I think, getting into it. There's there's a, I think, a momentum following the games. It's not all just down to the games because a lot of this was started way before. But I think strategically there's a better place. There needs to be more integration. Um, and we're beginning to tackle the hard questions like access to the school estate and beginning to make some progress. And we're working with Glasgow, East Lothian is too, authorities in that, that area. 
we do have a lot of data and it would be just interesting maybe have a conversation offline about how much you would find useful for the members. Um, you know, like around pricing, things like that. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah, I, I think we'd appreciate that because although we, we, we have you know, examined some of the numbers here today and some of the issues, our, 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 if, we have, if our focus has been the report that we produced in 2013, it wasn't necessarily about that. It was about capacity. It was about access and how we sustained an increase interest in sport that would expected that we expected to arise in and around the games and whether we could catch that enthusiasm and, and ensure uh, longer term participation um, you know so it is a bit disappointing to to hear that we're we're still struggling with the issues of access we don't we, we, we uh, you know, when we produced the the, 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 the support the, the the report we didn't think any of it was easy we knew that, that there were there were big there were big issues and uh, hopefully, at some point, we'll 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 look at volunteer resource as well, which we also uh, said in the report was absolutely essential about you know uh, understanding that workforce that would carry some of this enthusiasm and the split between sport clubs and indeed schools and wh where sport is, is is delivered. But Dean was wanting in. It, it was just add to that last comment around the access to the school estate. I know that the local authority has got a huge commitment to improving that, so it is a, an ongoing project community access to schools cats program that they've been working on we're obviously keen to support that on the one hand i think as a trust you could almost see it as a as a as a risk in terms of um, sort of opening access to a facility that might be close by to a, a, a sort of a trust run facility however we see that more as a, an opportunity we obviously have pinch points within our programming peak times difficult to get access for for some communities for some clubs for some users so strategically working together in terms of the programming of a school facility a school swimming pool compared to one of our swimming pools i think it's just going to be a benefit to communities and and users so that's something we'll be taking forward okay ian i think in our, in our area there's over the last three years there's been definite progress on two fronts one in terms of facility planning and now there's a definite policy whenever a new new high school is being built that all of the community facilities within a reasonable distance are grouped on the new campus. So, for example, in Wick, um, with Sports Scotland's assistance, um, the, the local town pool, which is probably in 1980s, about ageing, is being shut down. Local library is being closed. And fantastic new facilities on the school campus are being opened up. And, and High Life Highland will be running them on behalf of, of the local council. And that's, that's happening across the board. Even some of the bigger primary schools are get, <coughs> getting that treatment. And it means that it breaks down the barriers of people feeling that schools, once you've left school or left school for the day, you, the last place you want to go back to is the school. Um, it breaks down that barrier and it becomes schools go back to the days when they're hubs, hubs of the community. And I, I think that's real progress in our area. The, the other progress that's being made is um, for those schools that don't have, that aren't big enough uh, community facilities to have staff on site to, to operate them, um, the, the council's moving very much to handing over the, the overall bookings of all 29 secondary schools, all the community facilities mm -hmm. to ourselves, so that that allows, that allows some of the movement that, you would, that uh, Dean was talking about, where one facility is very busy but another one's quieter, or perhaps it's about not saying that these two or three facilities won't, won't be accepting community bookings because we're going to group them all together for efficiency into one, one local facility. So it's much more, much more efficient and actually will make the money go along. You know, money's always an issue, but, but it'll make it go a lot further. Do, do those uh, business, I uh, don't see any of my colleagues jumping in here. I mean, uh, Richard. Are, are, uh, I've got two questions, uh, convener, so if you're, if you're ready for them. One is that in our report we said that 25% of children leave primary school unable to swim. That's a fairly hard figure. That was in our previous report. Uh, do we know if that's improved? Well, I'll go on to my second question if that doesn't get an answer. <laughs> No. That, 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 that would be a national figure. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. So I can only speak from a, from a local level. It wouldn't be. I suppose it, it relates back to that. some of the initiatives earlier, the free swimming that my, my, my council offer and, and other councils offer. Has it, uh, has it improved that figure? I think to come in and speaking about 
in the earlier question, but linking it to swimming and the statistics there, how you design around that. So I'll give you an example. In East Lothian, our, our, our figures wouldn't be, be there. We, we have school curriculum swimming, and for people that pass the, the, a set criteria, they are then awarded 10 free swims. So you've passed, you've come out of school swimming, get into your local sports centre free of charge and, and go and swim in your local town. For those, and they tend to be in hard to reach communities because they potentially come from homes that, where they don't get to go swimming, A, they will have the block of swimming. B, if they fail to make the, the, the target, they'll have some top-up swimming that we've been able to do in partnership with the national agency. But thereafter, if they're still failing to make the criteria of swimming, and remembering we're a coastal authority, um, they have free access to our community Learn to Swim programme. So core provision in school, topped up in school. If they're still failing to meet a target, they will get free access into a community learn to learn swim program. I mean, that sounds like best practice to me. So is that being spread out? Um, it's not. It's very different um, across, the, across the piece. You know, the, in, in terms of what, what Amy was talking about there in terms of core provision, in, in some authorities, swimming is no longer part of core provision. That's just a fact. That's what education is telling us. I mean, others all around the table will be able to to tell their own story, but we, we find it really useful to work with each individual authority on their context and try and improve that. And there's a, there's a political and a management will required to, to, to deal with some of those things. We can't always have, as Eamon talked about, top up. Whilst the, the, the resources are welcome, it's not really dealing with the core issue, which is, um, you're almost talking about a, a, an entitlement, Richard, for every child to swim, which is probably where it used to be. But it, it isn't at the moment, um, but we'll continue to work with, with with local authorities and their partners, Scottish Swimming, to try and continue to improve it. Okay, Richard. Yeah, my second question, which I should declare an interest in, is in relation to NHS and social prescribing. Um, I should declare an interest. My son is a director of a company which has one of these smart watches that are being developed on physical activity and has had a significant grant to look at the aspects of the psychology of actually ensuring that physical activity continues with these smart watches. But anyway, that's a declaration. My question is, uh, really, in terms of, uh, it's already been mentioned, NHS in partnership with us. They are fundamental. I mean, they're, they're the only area that's getting an increase in funding. So what, what are actually the NHS doing in relation to the evidence uh, groups that we've got for, for us today? What are they doing to support the development of uh, physical activity, particularly in those who may be obese or who may be type 2 diabetics, where, you know, it's a fundamental necessity to have to them, for them to become physically active and to continue to be physically active. So how are they supporting you? What's happening in terms of actually writing a prescription by GPs? Is that something that's being done or looked at or supported? So just that general area. Billy, you want to take this one on first? Yeah. Um, hmm. A really important question, and I referred to our partnership with the NHS earlier. Um, in Glasgow, I, I think it's fair to say that we have a really, really positive relationship with, with the health board in the city. Uh, that's a strategic partnership that goes back some years now, um, and it continues to expand and be enhanced. Um, we operate, or, uh, already we operate, the I think the biggest GP referral scheme in the UK in Glasgow. Um, and, and that is absolutely about, if you like, creating a culture within general practice from a medical point of view where <laughs> physical activity is one of the key prescription tools that GPs have. Um, now, that's, that's actually been a long road. I mean, not that long ago, uh, GPs simply wouldn't, um, if you like, contract into that kind of process. That's changing. We work with the NHS in a strategic sense to try and influence the training of GPs, the training of, of clinical and medical staff, um, at the same time as working with the NHS to develop programmes, design programmes designed to, to deal with issues you've mentioned. Um, in practical terms, as an example, we have a number of posts within Glasgow Sports, uh, development staff, counsellors, coaches, who are entirely funded by the NHS. So that's a partnership that we that we operate with the NHS, um, and that's proved extremely successful. That partnership goes from strength to strength. 
Um, and in Glasgow, given the, some of the health indices in the city, um, that is a partnership with, that we are really, really keen to invest more and more in. I don't, I don't mean invest in terms of money, but in terms of resource and management time. Um, just, as, as, just to finish off, um, we're also working with the NHS to try and create innovative approaches. So I, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. William Bird and the Beat the Streets programme. We've brought him up a couple of times to, to talk to a group of stakeholders, including the NHS, and we're now working on developing some kind of population level saturation physical activity program to try and pilot that in one or two parts of the city um, along that line. That includes a technology aspect because people have to be able to measure on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute basis their physical activity. So we're talking to a couple of organisations and companies about how we might do that. So um, very much, I think, thinking along the lines that you're, that you're suggesting. That was a, an interesting response. I'm sure it may, maybe, you know, I mean, it interests me and I'm sure others, maybe we, we, as a committee we'd give some time maybe to go and see some of that work, uh, if you can maybe organise it. But you said biggest in UK, which is which is good. <laughs> but what, how, how big, how many people are we reaching? What you, you, you Shouldn't have mentioned it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, is it, you know, in terms of, 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 of the exchange of funding... Well, it's, it's, it maybe, it's maybe... N- n- in terms of numbers, that, you know, to say it's, it's the largest not. GP referral scheme in the UK, you, probably, you don't know if you're thinking 50,000. It's nothing like that. No. I mean, it, it, it's a, it'll be maybe 10 to 12,000, in a sense, referrals per annum. Um, pardon? That's still a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and over the years, we have refined and, and, and amended that scheme yeah. to try and make sure that it still meets the needs of, of service users. Interestingly, the percentage of referrals with uh, mental health issues has increased significantly over the last couple of years. Which, so we've had to amend the way that we train our counsellors to take that into account. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think, um, well, Kim said, right, it's the Health and Sport Committee, but I think that is a natural link for the Health and Sport Committee, you know, and a very interesting one that, that I'm sure some people would give time and maybe set something up there. That would be good. That, that would At some be, point in the future. That would be good. D- did I see an indication from you, Ian, there? Yes, please. Yes. Yes, thanks. Um, I think the, the big progress we've been making locally is a better understanding of what the NHS are looking for outside partners to deliver for them. So it's not about going along to the NHS and saying, we've got a good idea, can we have some money to deliver it? It's about going along saying, we see your targets here. Did you know that we can help you deliver that? So, for example, um, we've got a number of projects going on false prevention at the moment because... You know, every broken hip costs £67,000 before you blink an eye, that sort of thing. So the more we can help avoid them, the, the greater the, the saving to the NHS later on down the line. So we're now delivering falls prevention work in care homes, in day centres, in some of the community hospitals, and we've recently been invited into the biggest area hospital in, in Rigmore. So it's really breaking down the professional barriers between only physios can do this to here we have trained exercise people who are sensitive to the older population and understand what they need um, and some of the some of the anecdotal feedback from for example care home managers is my goodness you've given those two ladies there three years of their life back they used to come be wheeled out in the morning plopped into the chair lunch on their lap watching the telly all day they're now up walking going through for the lunch it's like they've got several years of their life back so you start to get that kind of evidence very quickly. And um, I'm sure we're not alone in, in any of these, but we're also doing lots of work on cardiac rehabilitation where the allied health professionals actually come into a leisure centre, they bring with them the, the people they're working with, and then gradually as the medical side diminishes and the, the sport and leisure side active lifestyle continues, so the, the aim is a seamless transition from somebody who's had a heart incident to somebody who's got a more healthy, active lifestyle long term. So there's lots, there's lots of great um, um, case studies across the country, both of councils and arms length organisations going on. Okay. 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 Right, Dean, thank you. <coughs> it was just to add to that, I mean, we've got examples we can make reference to from Edinburgh Leisure's point of view in terms of uh, healthy, active minds, mental health interventions, steady steps, falls intervention. I think the the point I wanted to make was just around your last comment regarding the the prescription in terms of 
we're trying to come up with a, a single point of referral process or system just to make it more efficient and effective. Just going back to what Billy said before, in terms of the funding that comes down from our health partners, pays for members of staff, development officers to manage, and usually requires a project assistant as well. I think where we need to be more effective and efficient is just how we administer the operation and delivery of that. You know, because we're all working at managing, administrating, recording um, the admissions and uh, referrals. Obviously, there's in, in implications regarding data protection, which we need to overcome. But it is just an area of work which strategically would be a massive boost and a massive help, be much more effective and efficient if we can get such a system in place. But we are working on it. Kim? Thank you, Convener. Um, <clears throat> I'm always delighted when, when you hear these great case studies and, and best practice. And, and I think that's, that's a challenge and a frustration as part of that, is we hear a lot of these great case studies. And, you know, I've heard Ian speak before about some of those examples of, you know, the work that they do. And, and again, Stuart could talk the same about the investment in active schools, the same as our colleagues at Scottish Athletics could talk about in relation to the investment that was from health that's gone into the Jog Scotland programme. There are any number of, of these great case studies. But I... I I guess I'm unsure, convener, where they are shared. There is there is no body that, that that does that sharing. None of us have have capacity or remit to do that. And I guess partly why that would be our plea to the committee and and hopefully as a collective in saying that there, there's a huge opportunity here. <coughs> Excuse me. We're doing some of the work with with some of the the health charities in Scotland around some of that and saying we we nick their figures. So we're having a little chat chat with breast cancer care, saying well we know that people being active can reduce breast cancer by between twenty and forty percent, but we never talk to you. We borrow your figures and you know you talk about it, and vice versa with with Sam H with the British Heart Foundation with with those big health charities and and, and the the. The commonality of message is, is so powerful, where they're saying we want people to be more active, as, as well you know, <laughs> being a doctor yourself, you know, the benefits of people being active. And I think there's a, there's a conversation shift to be had in that, where actually I think a lot of those health charities are, are really up for a discussion about the benefits of people being active and, and want to have a different kind of conversation in there. And I, I guess there's a little bit of facilitation to help make that happen. But we, we certainly would suggest there's a, a will in there. But I think part of it is is taking a stage back in, in perhaps better understanding when we talk about that radical shift in prevention and better understanding those real cause-effect relationships. So when we talk about social care and you talk about the link with, with the health budgets in terms of hospitalisation, I think we, we understand the link if somebody has a, a fall to the impact on, on on hospital admissions and the impact on social care because obviously so often um, a fall will result in a hip fracture. So I think half of women over 50 will have a fall that will result in a hip fracture or will have a hip fracture at some point in their lives. Well, as you start to track those cause-effect relationships back, I think we're good at getting back to the point of the fall being the impact on the breakage and being the impact on, on the impact on social care. What we're not so good at is going back to Ian's point and tracking that back and saying, well, people are 30% less likely to have a fall if they're physically active. And I don't necessarily feel that we take that cause-effect relationship to the stage back where that link between, between health and sport and people being active really comes into its own and where those opportunities would be. So, again, I think there's a significant opportunity there. And, and again, coming back to the point that this is about people living longer, healthier and happier lives. And the link within that in sport is... is is just you know remarkable at that individual level and at that population level so I guess I, there's hopefully that opportunity for the committee if, if the committee is minded to do so because I, I do think there's a gap that there isn't a, an automatic fit with anybody to take these great case studies the figures that have been quoted those great examples to pull that together and say okay here is the evidence about the the contribution of sport and being active this is why it's so good for health working with health and those health charities and to really champion where a difference can be made so hopefully it's a real opportunity for the committee. There's nobody doing it, so who should do it then? Who should uh, ensure the, the best practice across the... If it's not Sports Scotland or... Who, who yeah, well, I've, I've got an alternative view, as right, you can probably imagine. Um, I welcome what the, the Royal College has said recently, and it's the first time I've seen such a strong statement about the benefits of physical activity from inside the, the profession. Uh, there's lots of really good case studies um, around locally. Uh, another one I could add, healthy options up in Oban. Um, fantastic, but struggling uh, for longevity because there's no real policy. So, again, what I would be up for, uh, and might, maybe the committee can help, is, is some form of national conversation about this because it's, it's a void. And whilst there's great work going on, I think we need to get into that prevention conversation and to be able to say as sport, as a sector, this is what we can help with. We can't sort it all, but we can help. I was just looking at a statistic there um, 
which, which we have to be mindful of as well. Um, community Sport Hubs, 122 we've got data from, 8,881 deliverers, 92% of which are volley volunteer. And that's, that's a big commitment inside their own community. So taking on more is difficult, but if we can find a way to share resource, and the, the open example is a great one. If you ever get a chance, go there. Because the community health partnerships, along with um, the social enterprise that, that runs the sports activities, they've got a little social enterprise in the middle which employs a couple of people, uh, and people with chronic conditions are helped to become active in their own home uh, and out in the open. And, and some great stories that, that really inspire you. But it's very localised. And I think if we can have some form of conversation nationally, we'd certainly be up for that. 36 million uh, Scottish Government investment into sport plus lottery it pales when it comes into the, 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 the NHS budget. There must be some way in which we can work better together that national conversation is required. That's another point left with us. Mike was looking at me. I mean, I'm happy to take you in if it's, a, if it's at this point, Mike, if it's a supplementary of that discussion yes. because I've got Richard Lyle glowering at me. <laughs> so, yeah. One yeah. quick question because it's, it strikes me that um, the, there's been a lot of academic work, academic medical work, uh, you know, forging a pretty strong link between active lifestyles and health benefits. It seems to me, um, in terms of the discussion we're having this morning, the link that's perhaps not so well understood is that um, that between participation in sport, and we've heard some great evidence on that and the, the legacy effect being quite strong and apparent, um, but that translating into a more generalised active lifestyles on behalf of the general public, because we're the best well in the world, <coughs> Those actively participating in sport are only really, despite all those good figures, the tip of the iceberg. So I think the health benefits are well understood. Um, I think what's not so well understood is that the, the pound that's spent through your organisations translating all the way through that pipeline into perhaps pre a preventative spend figure in our health boards and, and, and the link, and I just wondered what um, our guests think of, or, or if they're aware of any work that has been done, um, perhaps it's something our um, committee can help with in terms of finding uh, that correlation and, and, yeah. and what that really proves that robustly. I'm looking for quick responses here because we're starting the year, we're in our last 20 minutes, and, and, and Richard Lay has been very patient. Mike, you can explain that supplementary to him after the committee. Kim, some uh, brief just, responses, please. Just to try and be quick, I, I think it's that real juggle, Mike, around what is the what is the value that, that people place on the benefits of people being active. And there are any number of suites as to whether it's skills acquisition, whether it's learning, whether it's increased employability, whether it's physical health, whether it's mental health, either in the benefits or the reduced risk. There are so many different ways of cutting it up. So let's make Scotland more active. Said so if we were all 1% more active every year for the next five years, we'd save £85 million to the economy. So if you want a financial stat, that, that's part of it. I'm not an economist. I can't tell you what that looks like. It would save 157 lives a year, which for me... People living longer, healthier, happier lives. That is the more powerful statistic. I'm an idealist, I'm not an economist, so I accept that there's a difference. So it depends how you want to cut that cake. Is there research? Absolutely. There is some of that financial stuff, but I think the quality of life stuff is where we're not winning. And I would, I would actually challenge your point in saying we understand the benefits of, of people being active and taking part in sport. Perhaps we do but I don't think the general public do. If you're talking about self-directed care, I'm sitting with a suite of figures that we could all quote day in, day out, and I don't think the public have that awareness that that is probably the best thing they can do to improve their own health. We've had that campaign around smoking, around other things which people understand. I don't think people have that same understanding around the benefits of being active, so I think there are some significant opportunities in there. Anyone, you know, it's a very good summary from Kim there, I think. Has anyone else got anything to add to that? Or any points? No? Thank you for that. Richard Ryle. Ah, thank you, convener. I, th I, thought was, I knew I was far away, but I didn't know I was in Princess Street. Um, <clears throat> no, in, in regard to the many comments that have been made, can, it, can I say, um, previously being a councillor for many years, I know the commitment of leisure departments 
pleasure uh, officials. Uh, I know the commitment is Stuart Harris and Sports Scotland and how many hubs you've done. And by the way, we're applying for one in Bell Sill, uh, and I hope you will support us in regards to that. And they're going to be uh, several clubs who are going to allow members of the public, encourage members of the public to come along. But I think it comes down, convener, to the point of, uh, and I refer myself to the Scottish uh, Sports Association presentation, which I'm sure Kim will come in and answer. But also, I have a question for the wider uh, uh, witness uh, panel. Um, you're on about the factor of schools, new schools or schools not being used uh, in the estate percentages, which are absolutely um, terrible. 35% of indoor space during term time, 17% in school holidays, 19% of outdoor space during term time, 11% in school holidays. Uh, you know, schools not being used. Um, there are many, many clubs out there, many excellent facilities and um, been built over the last number of years through Sports Scotland involvement, Lottery, Council, etc., 3G pitches, all the facilities, all the suite of facilities, facilities we see, but they're not being used. And it all comes down to, and I have to say it, because it was thrown at me a number of years ago, where I went and got funding from the then Scottish office to do a, a, a community centre and, and bring kids in, and we charged them nothing. And, and basically, uh, you know, we had loads of uh, people came. Um, affordability, facilities which received public investment, because it is public investment, through councils or whatever. I've got two questions, convener. The one is, should provide easy and affordable a rate which is not financially prohibitive access to community sports clubs. So, whilst we've got all these free taster sessions, whilst we've got all these, are we advertising enough and do we think that the prices that we're charging are suitable to people in Somerston, people in Belsill, the people in, uh, in Inverness or wherever? Um, and do we, do we think that we could do better? Kim, Billy. That's the, oh, okay. Dean. Um, Kim. I suppose very quickly, I, I am yeah. speaking on behalf of um, local authority colleagues here. And again, just going back to the community access to schools programme that they're working on, from a price and structure perspective, I'm aware they've got three different price bands. So you've got a, almost a professional fee, a voluntary fee, and a concessionary fee. So it's trying to reflect the different types of users that are going to be going to be coming in. I know there's also some linkage work going in to try and offer clubs that come in to use the school facilities some concession based on the fact that if they are part of the local community sports hub. So there's some benefits to sort of being part of all of the different aspects, different programmes going on there. Um, but like I say, I, I am speaking on behalf of the local authority and I'm sure they would be able to expand on that if if you so wish. Billy? Um, I mean, I suppose we've touched on this affordability issue already, and, and you know, in this conversation and other conversations, we always come back to it, and that's because it's such an important point. Um, in, in a local context within Glasgow, um, I think there are a, a number of reasons why the school estate is not utilised to the extent that we would all want it to be. Um, affordability maybe one of those, but I'm not sure it's the principal one. And I say that, so t let's take as an example, you mentioned 3G pitches. In Glasgow, we are lucky to have a significant estate in terms of third generation football pitches, some of which, most of which are managed through Glasgow Sport, but a number of which are part of the school estate. Now actually, in terms of pricing, the pitches in the school estate are cheaper than our price tariff but yet utilisation is much higher in the Glasgow sport pitches than it is in the school estate, where we charge more. So, so I, think, I think it's important, that, and we talked about this earlier, to look across the broad range of issues. I think there are programming and management issues r related to the school estate. In Glasgow, Glasgow, Glasgow Life administer the letting of schools out with school hours. Education services manage the estate. There's another organisation, in fact, another two organisations, depending on whether it's primary or secondary schools, employ the janitorial staff. So what you have is a very complicated landscape. And, and actually, that probably is a greater impediment to, to genuine community use than, than the price. Not, not for a minute suggesting that prices and affordability isn't important. Um, 
we're trying to grapple with that in Glasgow. As I mentioned earlier, there's a review and we're looking at ways to streamline that to make it easier for the public to understand actually how you get access to the school estate. Not always easy. Um, but part of that review, of course, will include looking at the kind of affordability issues. Thanks. Anyone else, Kim? Thank you, Thank you, Richard. Um, I think, um, can we do better? Yes, I suppose there's always the aspiration that we can, but I, I guess a lot of the rhetoric around the school state on, on behalf of our members, and, and I suppose on, on more widely on behalf of the voluntary sector, is, is these are public facilities, um, and so often they're public facilities at the heart of a community, and what an opportunity that presents, not just for sport, going back to one of the points Stuart made earlier about community hubs more generally, but around the voluntary sector, which you know is the underpinning fabric of so much of our civic society, and what an opportunity that could be, as I say, for all sectors. So w would sports clubs quite often want use of the games hall? Absolutely, but that doesn't mean to say there isn't a, an environmental group in the you know one of the classrooms next door, a knitting group, or whatever that might be. You know, and, and I think the huge opportunity around that is a, is a point that, that that you know where there is opportunity that we could make more of. I guess the opportunity that our members would raise is around clubs and the added value that club sport provides. And we've touched a little bit on, on that earlier. But I guess that's where that access to facilities opportunity, particularly whether it's school estate or other public facilities, presents an additional opportunity. We know the additional volunteering opportunities and skills development that come through people who participate in sport as part of clubs. We know what that looks like in terms of people who participate in sport through clubs participate more often and for longer than people who participate out with that environment. So again, added value and benefits there. The connections, the networks, the friends, the social um, integration that that brings in a different kind of way is really important in its own right. So the focus of part of that is on clubs in, in its own right. We would hear from, from our governing bodies who would say that affordability is a challenge for some clubs in some areas. That will vary across across local authorities and we've already heard different pricing structures and there are some fabulous relationships between local authorities and their clubs. So yes, there's a lot of great great practice. Is there more that we can we can, we can do? I'm absolutely sure there is. I think that, that idea of that portfolio facilities that's been discussed is really, really important. The idea that there might be any competition between a local authority trust and a school estate is a massive challenge. We need to make sure that absolutely doesn't exist. And it is about that portfolio and people working together. So can we do better? Yes. Do, do we get the sense that there's a will, that there's just these are public facilities which public should have access to for civic society? I think there is a generation around that discussion. Are we quite there yet? No. But do I know that there's a lot of good progress being made? So it seems. And again, our local authority partners would be closer to that. I, I, I like the point, if, if you'd let me just come into the other question that I have, um, since I've waited patiently for the last... Yeah, as others, as others, Richard, I'm yes, like, I'm I know. Yes, I know. You know, Stuart Harris made a, a very valid point, but again, you're dealing with 32 different councils who all have 32 different ways of doing, in my experience, uh, things, and, and we have to have a national conversation on how we can, right across the piece, involve sport, uh, schools, uh, council, NHS, etc. Can I ask the question I want, I've been waiting to ask? Now that many councils have went into trusts, right, and some have been successful, and I, and I have to say when North Lancashire, my own council went to, I was the SNP group leader on it, I was vehemently against it, but I, I've been proved wrong. Uh, they're, they've been highly successful, but again, uh, I think in some ways their charges are too high. Take note, North Lancashire Council. Um, do you think trusts are performing better uh, for those who are now in a trust than previously under the leisure department as it was in the old days? And, uh, are you given value for money? Yeah, so, some quick responses. Stuart, I think it was partly addressed to you, and I've got Ian Murray and I've got Eamon um, uh, who wanted to respond to your last question. I mean, on the yeah, previous yeah. question, yeah. I do apologize. Okay. Um, I mean, for me, every picture is different. Um, it's not so much about the structure, it's about what the plans say you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And I would take issue with some trusts about how they do some of that work. That's well known. It's on the record. But at least we're having a conversation about it. There's, there's no doubt that there's uh, a f more of a fleet of foot, more of a commercial nous that I think that trusts have, and a bit of freedom, I think, to make decisions that are in the best interests of their constituent groups. But we need to be mindful of that integration around the conversation with education, locally as well, that that's not forgotten. So it's back to the strategic position in each authority. What's the ambition? How is it organised? And how is it resourced? So that interaction, integration. 
Um, there are more probably, I think it's 23 trusts now. Um, most are going down that route. And if they go down that route for the right reason, not for a financial saving reason, it's for better delivery, then I'm all for it. If it's the wrong reason, then we'll probably store up some trouble. Ian, you wanted a brief comment on this. Thanks. <clears throat> um, obviously, I'm an arms like organisation, so I would say yes is the answer to your question. The reasons, I would say, is it has allowed... We're relatively young, three, three and a half years old. I would say it has allowed us a huge amount more focus on the, on the job in hand. Senior managers in any council service tend to get uh, diverted off into corporate issues within the council. What, what, as Previously, I was head of service within education, culture and sport, picked up the culture and sport bit and went into... At High Life Highland, and now I find that all of the management team have got a much, much focus on getting the job done, uh, a great deal more freedom, uh, speed, speed of operation. The int one of the interesting facts that's, that struck me is how we are how we are looked on by others. Previously, the NHS really struggled locally to to getting discussions with us because, well, you're the council, you do what the council does. The general feeling I have now is. Right, you're not the council, you're something different. It's somehow easier for them to come and speak to us and, and to, for us to get the doors open, as one example, but there's lots, lots of others. So I think there's a, quite a range of um, reasons why. Where I, where I would agree with Stuart that there are, I, I, I think there are some that are maybe over-focused on income and money and, and that, but I wouldn't blame the trusts, I would blame the, the host councils. The rules of engagement have to be absolutely clear when when trusts are established and, and changed councils have to be very clear what they expect out of it they're either council owned companies or they are still the, the councils are still the major funders and if there's any lack of focus on um, people who are hard pressed and not affording to get in well actually you know the council has that within their gift to say that's what we expect of you please do it and to be measured in the future amen yeah, and I'll work back, convener, if that's okay, on the trust yes. one, an area that had of it within course. the council, within my remit, then to put, it, put them out. I think the key is, and, and, and Ian's absolutely correct, I think the landscape could be a bit patchy, but absolutely there are trusts out there clearly evidencing the social responsibility that they have with public money, and there's evidence in relation to how they're delivering that, I think, and we've, we've got a couple here, today, or three here today that could evidence that. Picking back up on the school estate question, and the bit about access, I, I actually thought there was a, a misperception around the school estate in the start. I have to say that, the bit about it's not being used, they're not being used at all. And actually, I think when Sports Scotland commissioned that work, I think it dealt with that perception. I think that the, the bigger situation is need and capacity. Is the need and capacity, because it doesn't matter to me in East Lothian whether our organisations and our communities are accessing the school pitches or they're accessing our community sports pitches or facilities. Strategically, it does not matter. What it does allow us to do now that we've had a closer look at the school estate with our partners and audited use, what it has highlighted for us is where we've got some windows of opportunity that we need to move around strategically, it's allowed us to do that. But for me, school estate primarily sweating those facilities is sweating those facilities with curriculum physical education, after school sport and into school sport. If we're really serious as a nation about the school estate, let's absolutely fundamentally really work, work and hone in on school sporting activity. Yes, then we can look at community sports top up. But in an East Lothian context, our need and capacity is being met with a balance of strategic provision within the hearts of communities, both school and community. But it's allowed us by taking a closer look to see moving forward, which we will have as a growing authority with a you know, potentially 30% population uplift, mm -hmm. that estate is going to become really important to us strategically over future years about how we sweat both of those assets, community and school facilities. Okay, I've got um, a couple of uh, road I want to have got any other committee members making a bit at this point, the net you want in? Uh, I've got... I've got right, I'll t I'm going to take the people who haven't been in first, so it's Rhoda, Rhoda Grant and then Annette, Annette Millen, if you want in the net, and, uh, and I've got a couple others, and I've got 15 minutes max. Can I, can I ask two questions? One that hasn't been touched on at all, but I found really interesting um, from the Glasgow Live um, submission about um, 
employment and apprenticeships and the like that were created. And I think while that has a you know work has a lot to do with people's mental health, well being and the like, um, while it's not part of this committee's work, I, I was keen to hear a wee bit more about that and what opportunities are there, especially for kind of the more deprived areas. Yeah, you, I, I didn't regard it as part of the, the remit for this discussion, but um, going back to that um, argument about taking a holistic approach to, um, and within Glasgow Life, we, we have conversations where we use words like well-being and wellness, um, and looking at kind of individuals across the full gamut. Um, so as part of that, there has been a focus within both Glasgow Life and Glasgow Sport on the kind of employability agenda. There were the uh, Commonwealth apprenticeship schemes that we operated in Glasgow and continue to do so, and they've been extremely successful. Um, we also, um, and touching on the point about disadvantaged communities, so for as an example, if you think about the Emirates Arena, um, as part of the employed employability programme that we put in place there, we now employ 27 um, local youngsters who came through came in through that employability programme in the Emirates Arena in a number of different posts. So that's permanent full-time employment uh, that those individuals got as a positive outcome from a larger employability programme that we managed in partnership with Clyde Gately, a local economic development company. Um, we, we're always looking for opportunities to do, you know, to do that kind of thing. Another example, which might be in the submission, I'm not sure, is we operate um, a program called Coach Core, which um, is funded through the Royal Foundation um, and the UNA and the Tom Hunter Foundation, and that's about taking um, uh, again youngsters who um, haven't gone into full-time employment, haven't gone into um, training. Who are in that, you know, that occupy that difficult landscape. Um, so it's opportunities for that constituency to get involved in sports coaching, train the sports coaches, and the first cohort uh, of that program um, has recently completed. Uh, well, I think 95% of the participants going on to positive outcomes, either in terms of employment uh, or education. Some of the employment again with Glasgow Life, we have taken them on as coaches. Um, so in, in terms of our overall strategic approach to these issues, we don't see any distinction between employability, mental health, sport, physical activity. We absolutely don't. And in a sense, it maybe touches on the question that um, Mr. Lyle was asking about what, what do we see as the value of, of Glasgow Life as an arm's length organisation? And actually, one of the advantages is our ability to do that, our ability pulling together within Glasgow life as we do youth engagement, community engagement, physical activity, a whole range of different things, including libraries and museums, to take that holistic view. And the power that gives us, the power to work collaboratively and break those distinctions down has given us a real advantage compared to maybe, maybe more of a traditional local authority structure. Um, I hope that answers your question. That's helpful. Um, my second question is, um, Obviously, the Commonwealth Games give us a, a focus in listening to what people are saying today. You know, that was hugely successful in getting people more active. Um, but I think realistically, we all know we have to do an awful lot more. And I'm wondering where the next goals are. Uh, what are people trying to aspire to? And what will drive that, given that the Commonwealth Games are over? And yes, there's a legacy programme, but that focus goes off. How do we keep the focus on activity, on, on, on well-being? And, and how do we actually build on the legacy and, and set goals for that? Sure. Yeah. Um, for me, it's about continuing to be ambitious. There, there are 32 geographies which have got a whole host of partners inside them. Um, we're working well with, with the majority of them. It could be better. There is definitely some national conversation, I think, to, to be had, which would allow us to, to develop in... These, these, these areas from a national perspective. There's a, a strategic group for sport and physical activity in place, which I think has got real potential, which has got health, transport, education, sport, justice around the table, which could really get into the, 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 the big issues. 
There's an enthusiasm around, I think, f from um, the volunteer uh, workforce out there. Uh, and there will be lots of major events around. So the medals, the success will still be there. But I think if we can all work better together and, and really, Duncan mentioned earlier on, focus on the outcomes. And the outcomes are about participation, engaging and keeping engaged and also progressing, pr progression. But it's going to take ambition, it's going to take resources, and it's going to take a, an, an integration of those resources locally. But I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can build on that uh, as a nation uh, and, and, and be ambitious for our communities. Kim? Um, thanks. Sorry, just, just building on that. I absolutely agree with Stuart's point about ambition. Um, our submission talked a little bit about Rhoda's point around around building that momentum and, and, and working beyond the legacy. A couple of the parts that we maybe haven't touched on today, I know PE and school sport's always a particular favourite. There's been, again, significant progress, as I'm sure we're all well, well aware of. And, and again, that's something to absolutely be celebrated. I think the quality focus of that is, is, is still the, the, the main priority now as we move forward. There's been a, a huge investment um, from the Scottish Government through Sports Scotland and Education Scotland around CPD for teachers. That, again, is enormously welcomed. But again, if we don't address the prioritisation of PE in initial teacher training, we're going to be plugging that six million gap between now and the end of time. So I think, again, there's a priority in there that can make a significant difference. So that would be a, a, an ask of our members. You mentioned volunteering a little bit earlier, convener. I think there's a huge opportunity still around there. I think there's still a, a latent opportunity of a legacy around that. We've talked previously about employer-supported volunteering, the massive opportunity of the Games to people look differently at the benefits of volunteering, not just for sport, but the wider voluntary sector. Lots of organisations, additional special leave come Games time. Back now to the day a year, two days a year. It helps run events. It doesn't underpin volunteering in civic society. So I think there's a significant opportunity that remains there. And the last part that we haven't perhaps picked up in that same way was performance. So again, Stuart touched at the beginning about the, the enormous success of the Games. The fact that add that through the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic cycle, it's the most successful period we've ever seen for performance sport in Scotland. Again, to be enormously celebrated. Compare it to looking through the 2012 Olympics and Paralympics, there was the announcement of the UK government at that point around continued resource towards Rio. As I'm, my understanding, convener, the additional investment that has gone into performance sport was for the Games and is no longer. So again, where is the legacy around performance sport? Stuart mentioned those structures and systems, world-class systems. Our systems have proved to be the best that we've ever had from a performance point of view. So there's continuity of ask in there to say we want to continue to build on that. And for that, you'll get it, Rhoda. Nanette. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about Tim and employer supported volunteering uh, and uh, you know Kim's obviously answered that question but to take that that forward how do you see the way forward for that to, to get back to where you were just ahead of the Commonwealth Games and, and get more interest from employers have you got a, any ideas for actually doing that I think there are a number of different opportunities with that I think people have have seen the excitement around volunteering but again I, do, I, I think there's a change in, in language about how we talk about volunteering I think we're very good at saying please Nanette volunteer we need somebody to do whatever please please will you help out as opposed to changing that conversation a bit and saying Nanette we are needing a whatever that might be but here's what you might get out of it and I don't think we have that that same discussion around volunteering it was part of the submission of our paper and say there's um, a 20% benefit in terms of premature mortality if people volunteer now it's not quite as much as if they're active and, and participate in sport but again it's it's significant and I think some of that is galvanizing the voluntary sector together and kind of saying you know and that's obviously a conversation that we've had in saying this would be as our members have said all along the biggest volunteering legacy so there were 50,000 <coughs> excuse me 811 applications they weren't all from Scotland obviously for the games but that broke records where are we breaking records in relation to the legacy for volunteering yes there will be some of those people who will be focused on an event legacy who want to volunteer in events and there are mechanisms for that but where are we turning that round into conversation where are we looking at the Scottish Government and other organisations as exemplars in that and saying we value volunteering we value that as a benefit to an individual and we val value that as a benefit to the organisation in terms of recruitment retention productivity keep going through that list and I don't think we have that conversation we have great conversations as a nation around the rights of an individual um, for flexible working if it's, if it's childcare and rightly so but we should have an entitlement for people to contribute to their society. We talk about so much about empowerment of communities, and rightly so. But where's there a point in empowering communities if you aren't enabling communities? The least active so often with, amongst communities are in, our, are in our most deprived communities. That is so often where there's least volunteering. It's so often where people are most time deprived. We all appreciate, and I think it was a key factor of our report in 2013. Everybody loves volunteers. 
the people who deliver sport are the best people in my community, and I'm, you know, we all we all need and all that. We asked our ask as a committee to this community and wider was how do we define a volunteer? How do we how how many volunteers are out there? How do we ensure recruitment and retention? How do we identify the gaps in volunteering, like you, you know, described there about the Pive communities? Will be too many volunteers in some communities and not enough in others. How do we fund? How do we resource that? We ask basically for an audit for sports people involved in sports, people who are involved in the delivery of sport. Give us an audit. How many volunteers have we out there? How many do we need? Because we can throw the doors open in every sports facility, as Stuart said earlier. Throw them open, pay them again, and there's, you know, never mind free, pay them again, throw the doors open. We have not got the capacity to deal with the ambition that has been described around this table today. So how do we do that on the volunteers? Is there an audit? Do we know how many people are out there? Do we know where the gaps are? Are, we, are the strategies and the business plans uh, addressing uh, the, the, these issues as, as the Sport Committee asked uh, way back in 2013. George? Um, I talked to you earlier on about a, a more systemic approach to, to sport. People's a, a key part of that. So to get participation in progression, you need to enable that. So people, places, profile, the, telling the stories I think is important. You and I had a conversation the last time about the value of a, a national figure, which I think was 192,000 in terms of volunteers. That's a one moment in time. And what I'm happy to share with you is where we've got to around the clubs and community sport hubs and the data we have around all of that, which is pretty detailed now, uh, way ahead of where it was before. And what it does is tell you the health of that community uh, and the number of volunteers. So I gave you that national picture, 122,881. Uh, distinct deliverers, 92% of which are uh, are um, volunteers. So we have that picture across 122 community sport hubs. We've got a partnership with governing bodies where we, I think there's 110 from memory, sports development officers, sports specific, whose job is to work with community groups and clubs. They have data as well. We've got 90 clubs and a direct club investment. Again, we've got the data there. So we're, we prefer that kind of information, which we are adding to what people have locally uh, to try and determine capacity. Um, and as the guys will probably tell us here, it's all about demand-led. We, we can't just well, throw the doors open and it'll all happen for the very reasons that you said. Demand and gradually build that infrastructure and that economy of provision by local authorities or trusts and communities doing things for themselves. And I think that we're making a lot of progress, I think, in taking that forward and building that capacity. Eamon? Yeah, I, I was going to come in on the other question, but I'll, I'll just pick up on, on, on Stuart's point. I've, I'm looking at something in front of me here, which is exactly around what you're asking, Chair, and a community called Preston Pans within East Lothian. Some of you may recognise that name around this table. Um, you know, one community, 148 coaches, 1,600 participants, 12 different venues, 10 clubs. It's like drilling that national information that Stuart's making reference to into what does it look like in a community? How many volunteers are there? How many clubs are there? What venues are they using? But they're part around the one table because the approach we've taken for community sports hubs is not one site, not one venue, not one school or it is actually community planning for sport that's got all of those clubs, along with their physical educationalists in the primary and secondary schools, along with a sports-specific officer representing that community, planning, sharing collegiately for sport within that community. So why are we having football and rugby sessions at the same time? Let's look at the timetabling of that. Let's give that choice and variety within a community. So it's that type of conversation there, convener. But if I can just pick up on the earlier question, I wanted to come in on that, which was around, there was a real nervousness <coughs> around the games being the tipping point and what comes next and the risks in relation to, will we lose sight? Will our sight lines change? So what are the priorities? I think locally and nationally it will be concurred. What is the sport in infrastructure locally in relation to creating the opportunities to participate, 
and ensuring you've got the progressive systems to allow people to come through locally. I think that would be from a sporting bit, but what I would shift, I think, I think is absolutely loud and clear for all of us, is around the shift from inactivity to activity and wider physical activity and targeting inequalities. I think if you were to ask us what the priorities would be, they would be the three things. Graham Day, and then Bob for the last question, I think. Uh, thank you. Uh, following on from Eamon John's point at the start of the session, that these were essentially Scotland's games and taking in all 32 local authorities, to what extent is facility infrastructure to widen access to sport being delivered in rural or semi-rural settings, accepting the associated challenges, but bearing in mind we've got deprivation, health and fitness issues, as well as aspirations to compete in sport in these communities as well as the major cities. I mean, in conurbations, you can build one huge facility and cater for many, many people, but in a rural setting, you need to have multiple swimming pools, athletic tracks, indoor facilities spread across a range of population centres in order to provide the same kind of access to a similar number of people. And, of course, smaller rural schools don't offer facilities such as 3G pitches that can be tapped into. So I just wonder how well we're responding to that challenge. And, for example, how many of the hubs that we've talked about today are located in such settings? Ian? I think one of the enthusiasms that has lasted from the Games is is that creation of the sports hubs. And I think it's one of the, the, the good things that Sports Scotland have been doing over the last few years. Um, I have to confess, I wasn't really sure how they would work in our area. But um, you take the, uh, the, the Queen's Baton Relay, for example, in Thurso, right in the north coast. That was used as an excuse for a great big uh, celebration of local heroes, local sporting volunteers, and a great big party, a sporting party, if you like. But what that did was break the ice between a number of clubs that exist, have existed in the town for generations, but with a great deal of suspicion between them. And they've come together to help create 500 people odds, get, came together to create a great sporting party. And the result of that is that, oh, right, we've got shared resources, you could loan that equipment. Could we have that joint training session when you're doing that one? Can we come along too? And they've, they've gone ahead now and, and the Thursday Sports Hub has, is the result of that. And it's, it's forging ahead with great enthusiasm. So on the, the Games did leave a very good legacy in terms of Sports Hub in our area. We're now on to our fourth one and we're moving with another four or five in the background. Um, the earlier point I made about... Um, the council's view and policy now is very much we can't afford to have swimming pools everywhere. We have to choose exactly where they go. So we take the absolute opportunity when there's a big new secondary school or a big refurbishment. That's where it's going to that's where the focus is going to be and that's where we bring all the community facilities in so that we have a few strategically placed um, facilities right across. So, so no, maybe I, I wouldn't dare to suggest that it was because of the, le the game's legacy that that's happened. It's just common sense and partnership working coming together at the right time. No one else? Can I have a quick question to Mr. Harris? If you don't mind. Right now? Yeah. Before, before I take. Uh, before Bob. you take Bob. Uh, if, Mr Harris, you, you spoke earlier about uh, conferences, etc. I used to be, as a councillor, I used to be uh, the, the chair of a subgroup for sport for APSE, Association of Public Service Excellence, and also attend the COSLA AGM yearly. Sport Scotland always was there. Do you ha Have you ever carried out a conference where you've invited 32 councils or associated groups, people in this room, to sit down and discuss a national policy? Uh, we do quite a lot of that, to be honest, but COSLA have done quite a bit of that for us, and I think they've been quite well placed to do it. Um, the conversations have been held. Um, COSLA have brought all of the senior representatives from local authorities together, um, meets around about four times a year, jointly chaired by the minister, Archie Graham from Glasgow. Mm. Um, it, it is a... It's a wee bit frustrating because I think it could probably do more. It could investigate itself a bit more in terms of that uh, consistent agenda that we all have. Um, but I guess I would probably say, Richard, that we can have all the conferences we like, but if it's not reflected in action locally, so it's plans, ambition, resourcing, 
an interaction, then it, it probably wouldn't matter, to be honest. But there's some good sharing of practice, um, be assured of that. Thank you, Convener. Bob Doris. Uh, thanks, Convener. I know it's been a, been, a, been a long session. I feel it's came full circle a little bit for myself because we're talking about different structures at a, a local level and different partnerships. And what I was asking at the start is how we how we measure the outcomes of, of some of that. And I just wasn't sure whether there was a, a consistent uh, measure across all 32 local authorities in terms of those who are getting more active, whether that's through Glasgow Life or other agencies, whether it's through the, the club system, whether it's through community sports hubs, whether it's a local cycling group, whether it's a, a local walking group, whether it's a local dance group, a huge growth for, for, for a lot of uh, women in particular, and whether we're capturing that and be able to cross-reference who's doing what, when, where. Privacy considerations I, I accept around that, but just so we can then work out where the black spots are and put in those additional resources and targets that, that we all want to see. And usually the people that are doing the job in those areas are youth workers, um, not formal sports clubs quite often. So, you know, North Glasgow, name check my local North Eighty Community Young People's <coughs> Futures, Royston Youth Action, doing great jobs, linking in for sports groups where they can. But in terms of how they're resourced and how clubs that perhaps don't necessarily go through the club mark system or have have that relationship with national governing bodies that you might you might expect, whether when we look at the funding streams that's come through to support local community physical activity, whether we have to just start to look at some of that criteria that is insisted upon and think more cleverly about how we invest in youth work as a gateway towards then feeding into clubs, because you have to engage with young people at a level they want to be engaged with in the first place before you can actually go to a badminton club, it's great. You have to get the trust of them and develop the, their capacity as human beings and build up trust with them before you channel them into all this other wonderful stuff that's, that's out there. And I'm just wondering, just some reflections on consistent data collection across the country, just it would open up a whole other conversation, but I think that's quite important to myself. And just thinking a little bit more cleverly about how we then use that to use youth work provision and maybe those that don't necessarily have that closest relationship with national governing bodies and give direct funding towards local community initiatives. Billy? Just very briefly on, on the statistics issue, um, I think at the moment the only kind of consistent national um, information that you can get is from the household surveys at, at, at the moment. I think one of the weaknesses is that, yes, we are all capturing. I mean, there's a wealth of data, um, but it is inconsistent. And also, I think you can capture all the data that, that you like if you're going to actually take it into account and, and design services around it. And I think there's a challenge there. On the second issue, um, I think from, from Glasgow Sport, I think we probably agree with you. I think there is a requirement for us to think about non-traditional ways of getting people engaged in physical activity, um, innovative ideas. So we work very closely with Scottish Sport Futures in Glasgow, for instance, who have developed, in a sense, through a, a youth engagement agenda uh, initially. Um, and there's a number of agencies in Glasgow who quite rightly challenge us um, about you know engaging with them much more proactively. You know. These are organisations who don't come from a traditional, you know, sports club um, kind of context. So I think that is a, I think that's an important point. Yeah. I think we've worn them out of submission, uh, convener. No, I, but you know, well, uh, if we're coming to an end at this point, I should, uh, you know, uh, thank you all um, for your precious time, your contributions this morning, and your written submissions. Very much appreciated. I think. Uh, um, your enthusiasm for the work that you do comes comes across. I think that came across again the, this morning. Um, we've enjoyed working with you in the past. We have some ideas as a committee, we, we, you know, and we would look forward to working again with you uh, in the future. And uh, we'll take the opportunities from the additional information that we receive to 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 try and do that and to ensure that there is uh, indeed. Um, a, a legacy ongoing, not just from the Commonwealth Games, but for all of the investment that's been made uh, right across Scotland. Thank you very, very much for your time and attendance here this morning. Um, we're suspending very briefly at this point before we go to our next stage. Stuart, I'm, I'm just saying to you.